I'm Kasia Madeira, and in the early hours of Monday the 17th of July, these are our main stories. There's a new king of centre court as Carlos Alcarez triumphs at Wimbledon. Italians are told to stay indoors as Europe braces for another heatwave. And... The singer Jane Birkin has died aged 76. We'll be looking back over her life. Also coming up in this podcast, authorities in Iran are cracking down on women who leave their hair uncovered. And how Lionel Messi could change the face of football in America. We start at the world-famous Wimbledon Tennis Championships. The 20-year-old Spanish player Carlos Alcaraz has beaten seven-time champion Novak Djokovic to claim his second Grand Slam title after a tense and thrilling match that lasted almost five hours. Speaking right after the final, Djokovic, who was beaten on centre court for the first time in 10 years, told the crowd, It's a tough one to swallow when you are so close. I lost to the better player and I have to congratulate him and move on. The BBC's Del Lloyd was at centre court. We've witnessed an epic four hours and 42 minutes. Carlos Alcaraz at age 20 years and 72 days. He's that young, playing in his first ever Wimbledon final and dethroning the king of the All England club, Novak Djokovic, who was bidding for an eighth title here. Remember a few weeks ago, Novak Djokovic um, won the French Open, his 23rd Grand Slam title. He's been... The pretender to Djokovic for the last year or so, Carlos Alcaraz, but he's proved he can play with him, alongside him, and he's proved he can beat him on grass. A terrific, terrific story. It was a five-set epic, and I don't think the thousands and thousands of people that had a seat on centre court today could quite believe what they were witnessing. But there's a new superstar in tennis, and his name is Carlos Alcaraz. And epic, as you say. So tell us a little bit about the match, because there was actually some bad-temperedness from Djokovic. Uh, there was uh, during certain points uh, Djokovic actually won the first set 6-1 the second went to a tie break which Alcaraz took 8-6 and in the third set we did see a few issues um the fifth game in particular of that third set, so crucial, it took 26 minutes. Alcaraz won the third set, 6-1. And then in the fourth set, which Djokovic ended up winning 6-3, uh, I think he hit his racket against the net post. It was either in the fourth set or the fifth set, I can't quite remember. But he was getting angry, frustrated at the tennis that Alcaraz was playing. And also the crowd were perhaps getting on Djokovic's back. And it was very breezy out here on centre court today. So Djokovic, the frustration came out at certain points. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't fuel him in the right way because Carlos Alcaraz was just playing sublime tennis and dealt with the pressure superbly to serve out the match to win it 6-4 in the fifth. The truly remarkable occasion. Delith Lloyd reporting. More extreme heat is forecast across the northern hemisphere. In southern Europe, a second heat wave is predicted to hit this week, while in the United States, temperature records could be broken. On the Spanish island of La Palma, fires are continuing to burn out of control and thousands of people have been told to leave their homes. While in Italy, there are warnings to stay indoors as temperatures soar. Sofia Batizza reports from Rome. In Italy, an anti-cyclone could push temperatures above 45 degrees. It's been named Karen, the one who carries the dead in mythology. There have been red alert heat warnings in 16 Italian cities today. The Italian weather agencies say they've never seen anything like this in terms of intensity, duration and number of areas affected. Locals and tourists here are being urged to take this seriously, to stay indoors in the afternoon, stay hydrated and take care of the elderly. Last year, more than 60,000 people died across Europe because of soaring temperatures. And with this heat wave expected to continue well into next week, there is no respite in sight. Sofia Batizza in Rome. Meanwhile, in the United States, more than 100 million people in 14 states are currently affected by excessive heat warnings. From Washington, here's our correspondent, David Willis. 
Temperature records are expected to be broken in at least 38 cities, with the focus on the south and the west of the country. Today could mark the hottest day ever in the gambling town of Las Vegas, with the mercury poised to hit 47 degrees and stay at that level for much of the week. The first two weeks of July have already been the hottest on record in another desert city, Phoenix, which yesterday saw temperatures of more than 43 Celsius for the 16th day day in a row. And it's hot down south as well. The city of El Paso in Texas has seen temperatures of 38 Celsius and above for more than a month now, and there appears to be no respite in sight. California's Death Valley, traditionally one of the hottest places on Earth, is today expected to see temperatures of around 54 Celsius, close to the record of 56 Celsius that was set back in 1913. The advice from the National Weather Service is blunt, drink plenty of water and stay indoors. David Willis. Police in Iran are relaunching patrols to catch women who are not covering their hair in public. Unverified images have appeared showing police officers berating and arresting women who are not following the strict Islamic dress code. The issue triggered widespread protests following Masa Amini's death in custody 10 months ago. The 22-year-old was arrested for having an inappropriate hijab. Our reporter Azadeh Mashiri told me more. This is the culmination of progressive steps that the Islamic Republic has been taking. Now, uh, one of the government's responses to the anger you mentioned uh, after the death of Masa Amini in the morality police's custody was to pull them from the streets. The same morality police who denied her family's accusations that she was harmed and beaten in their custody. Her father said that to the BBC. And there were mixed messages at the time about whether it would be disbanded forever. But officials were certainly saying there would be change, that things would simply not be the way that they were before. And yet, 10 months later, those promises have not only fallen short, but there has been a complete reversal now. The Marathi police has returned to the streets of Iran, and it confirms uh, in a highly symbolic way uh, that the Islamic Republic is intent on enforcing the mandatory hijab law, on quashing any crackdown, and it comes only days after the country marked Iran's hijab and chastity week. So, Azadeh, given the strength of feeling that we had following Massa's death, what are we expecting now, seeing that the morality police are potentially back on the streets? Well, as I said, this has been very progressive. There's been this push and pull between authorities uh, and protesters. Iran's authorities have been committed to a stricter enforcement of the mandatory hijab. It's clear that they're committed to continuing this crackdown on dissent. Uh, And remember, tens of thousands of protesters have been arrested. We know that seven of them have been executed. And of course, hundreds uh, have been killed on the streets. So when when it comes to the protests themselves, they're happening uh, to to a far lesser extent as they were before. But that's also why uh, women have been taking to social media, why they've been using music and dancing, because those are safer forms of protests. Uh, But this news today is also in response to the fact that the streets of Tehran and other cities in Iran simply don't look the same. Women are walking around uh, often without their hijab. And just on Saturday, organizers of an Iranian cultural festival in Tehran's landmark Milad Tower literally turned off the lights to hide the fact women were taking off their headscarves, waving them in the air, dancing. You can still hear it, though, even if you can't see it. So we're hearing protests still ongoing. I think it's worth, Azadeh, you just reminding us why the hijab is so important in Iran. Well, Kasha, it comes down to the fact that for the Islamic Republic, they view the hijab as not only a religious symbol, uh, but also because it symbolizes the Islamic Republic itself, the ideology. And so when they see people fighting against the mandatory hijab law, they see it as fighting against the regime itself, because that's what protesters have been calling for. They haven't been calling uh, for a cancellation of this law and then to go back to everything else. They want a completely new system. And remember that President Ibrahim Raisi is a hardline cleric, and he is a former head of the powerful judiciary. A moderate Iran was never going to happen under his watch. And that's not even what protesters were calling for. They just wanted a whole new system uh, as a whole. 
Azadeh Mashiri. A deal brokered by the UN with Russia, which allowed Ukraine to export its vital grain supplies, is due to expire on Monday. Early on Sunday morning, the last ship to sail under the deal left the port of Odessa. Russia has not yet extended the agreement. Since the war began, bread prices have increased dramatically in many developing countries, triggering an increase in food insecurity across the world. Our Europe regional editor, Paul Moss, told me more. Ukraine was famously described traditionally as the breadbasket of the world because it exported so much grain. And much of that went through the Black Sea. But Russia's invasion, of course, turned this trade thoroughfare into a war zone and cargo ships certainly weren't willing to venture into it. And the consequences were immediate. There were reports of Ukrainian farmers' harvests rotting unused. But it was catastrophic for other countries, particularly poorer ones, because the shortage of grain meant the price went up. And that meant that people in very remote areas of remote countries were unable to afford food because of a war in a very far away place, which many of them may not have heard of. And so a deal was struck, which said that Russia would allow cargo ships to pass through the Black Sea, promise not to attack them. But this was done in coordination with Turkey, who said that the ships could be inspected in Istanbul to check they weren't being used for something like weapon smuggling. And the deal really worked. I mean, there were some hiccups, but since it was agreed, uh, the last figure I've seen suggests that 33 million tonnes of grain was exported through the Black Sea and the price of grain went down again. Food prices stabilised. So the deal worked, but what's the issue now? Well, Russia has still not agreed to renew it, and that's despite the fact the deal is due to expire in just a few hours. Now, what they say is that one part of the deal hasn't been fulfilled. The United Nations, which was part of the deal, promised that they would help Russia to get its own grain and fertilizer to international markets. Russian food exports actually aren't sub- subject to sanctions. But the trouble is that other problems Russia has mean it's very difficult for them to sell their grain abroad. Uh, cargo ships can't get insured if they're carrying Russian goods. There's a problem with the the payments because they're restricted on their access to the world's financial systems. They say the UN promised to help with this and hasn't kept its side of the bargain. But, you know, there is something else going on here. There is speculation here that the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, was a big part of this deal. It was convened and agreed and signed in, in Istanbul. And Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, is certainly not very happy with the Turkish president at the moment. President Erdogan last week agreed to let Sweden join NATO. He's helped some Ukrainian prisoners of wars to get home. It could be that President Putin is showing his displeasure with Turkey. But as so often with the Kremlin these days, we are in the realm of speculation. Paul Moss reporting. Tributes have been paid to the singer and actor Jane Birkin, who's died from cancer at the age of 76. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, was among those praising her work, describing her as the complete artist who embodied freedom. Jane Birkin came to prominence in the 60s with her risque collaborations with the controversial French singer Serge Gainsbourg, not least with their breathless song Je t'aime, moi non plus. Our arts correspondent David Silito looks back at her life. Je t'aime had originally been written for Bridget Bardot, but the version that was released in 1969 was recorded near London's Marble Arch and featured a singer who was, in her own words, a shy English girl who'd grown up in Chelsea and met the actor and songwriter Serge Gainsbourg on the set of the film Slogan. The heavy breathing near the song's climax was too much for the BBC and the Catholic Church, but it helped turn Jane Birkin into a star who came to epitomise a certain racy French bohemian cool. I just thought it was great fun because uh, Serge said, you know, we couldn't get a better PR than the Pope. I think I knew that it would be fairly shocking because we were in a sort of underground restaurant and we watched as people just sort of stopped eating and they were all there with their knives and forks in the air and Serge whispered to me and said, I think we've got a hit record. (laughs) Couldn't you give us just a couple of minutes? A couple of minutes. Her first film role that made an impact was Blow Up in the 60s. After that, a long award-winning film career, largely in France. She and her on-off partner Serge Gainsbourg were for a while the couple of French society. Hermes, 
famously created a weekend bag named in her honour. Tributes to her life and work were today led by President Macron. Jane Birkin, actor, singer, campaigner, a very English French star. David Silito on the life of Jane Birkin, who's died in Paris at the age of 76. Still to come on the Global News podcast. They are moved into the disposal canister. The canister that consists of two pieces. The insert is cast iron and the outer shell is, is the thick copper. Why Finland is about to become the first country to bury spent nuclear fuel rods. That's coming up. The storming of the US Capitol in 2021 led to the arrest of more than a thousand Americans. The events on January the 6th spawned a huge investigation. Congressional hearings continue to reverberate through the country's politics. But now there's a new narrative emerging in some quarters of the American far right, who'd previously shown remorse. It's the idea that the riot was not just mostly peaceful, but that it was the right thing to do. Among them is one of the most recognisable faces in the mob, the man known as the QAnon shaman. He talked to our reporter, Mike Wendling. Thousands of people stormed the U.S. Capitol in January 2021. But if you remember just one face in the crowd, it probably belongs to this guy. Well, I mean, I guess you could say that all of America, all the world is my tribe. Jake Angeli, also known as Jacob Chansley, and even better known as the QAnon shaman. QAnon is the sprawling conspiracy theory that says, among other things, that Donald Trump is fighting a holy war against a cabal of elite satanic pedophiles. Angeli's brand of shamanism led him to dress in fur, horns, and red, white, and blue face paint as he broke into the Capitol, lofting a flagpole, a moment that was captured on camera. Angeli pleaded guilty to obstruction of an official proceeding, trying to thwart the peaceful transfer of power. He apologized to the court. But now that he's out of prison, he's not sorry anymore. Regrets only weigh down the mind. They're like sandbags on a hot air balloon. That said, there is one thing he would like to change, his guilty plea. He's gone back to court to try to overturn it. He doesn't like the excuses his original lawyer came up with to explain his actions that day. He said all sorts of things that I never said or asked him to say. I never said I was duped by Trump. I never said that I denounced Q or QAnon community. Never said that. And I am not schizophrenic, bipolar, depressed or delusional. Jake Angeli is not alone. Several other rioters have also renounced their admissions of guilt. It's part of a trend on the far right of American politics, not just downplaying or dismissing the storming of the Capitol, but actively celebrating participation in it. They ripped me away from my wife and my four young children, and they held me hostage as a January 6th political prisoner, all because I'm a conservative who had the courage and the backbone to stand against them. Derek Evans was a member of the West Virginia State Legislature. He traveled to Washington on a bus filled with Trump supporters, followed the crowd, and briefly entered the Capitol. We're in! We're in! Derek Evans is in the Capitol! After he pleaded guilty to civil disorder, he was sentenced to three months in prison. Now he's running for U.S. Congress, and his participation in the riot is not something he's shying away from. In fact, he's proud of it. It was not only a moment, it was a historic moment that's obviously going to go down in history, and I think as time continues to go on, I'm going to be proven to be on the correct side of history on this. The false claims of the election deniers, that the Capitol riot was actually a peaceful, patriotic, legal protest, were given a boost earlier this year by Tucker Carlson, the former Fox News host, who broadcast tapes of Jake and Jelly and others. Within hours of January 6th, literally hours, you began to hear that day described as a deadly insurrection and not described by one... Experts say this brand of January the 6th revisionism has so far failed to take off among the wider public. But if it does, it could pose a threat to American democracy. Jake Angeli, the QAnon shaman, is asking the court to throw out his plea. Ironically, if he's successful in his appeal, prosecutors for the Department of Justice say they would consider putting him on trial, which could land him right back in prison. Mike Wendling.
Finland is about to become the first country to bury spent nuclear fuel rods deep underground as a way of disposing of them. Spent fuel remains highly hazardous for hundreds of thousands of years. Many other countries are already looking at a similar way of storing nuclear waste. So could it be an effective solution for the very long term? Erika Benke has visited the facility in Western Finland. We are going down in a tunnel at Onkalo, which will be the world's first permanent disposal site for highly radioactive nuclear waste. 450 meters below the ground in this facility created in the bedrock in Western Finland. It's a four and a half kilometer drive, about 10 minutes. I'm in a car with Antti Joutsen, his principal geologist for Posiva, the company building Onkalo. So we have these granitic rocks in here, and then we have uh, these gneissic rocks in here. So it's very hard, isn't it? Yeah, it's very hard. And pretty old too, almost two billion years old. We just arrived at the service area. 437 meters below the ground. I can see workers in high-vis jackets and helmets doing their jobs. There's two men standing on a cherry picker attached to harnesses, fixing cables in the ceiling. How much nuclear waste will be stored here? It's gonna be five thousand, five and a half thousand tons of, of spent fuel. Fuel rods from all over Finland will arrive here and first above the ground there's a facility to encapsulate them. So what exactly happens there? Johanna Hansen is research and development coordinator at POSIVA. They are moved into the disposal canister. The canister does consist of two pieces. The insert is cast iron and the outer shell is, is the thick copper. In Onkalo, there will be three barriers around nuclear waste. First, they put it in copper canisters and then they wrap the canisters in bentonite, which is a water-absorbing clay. And then finally, they bury the canisters in the bedrock. But there are critics. Scientists at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm say that corrosion of copper will be a problem. But Posiva argues that copper doesn't corrode in the absence of oxygen, such as when buried in the bedrock, surrounded by bentonite clay. In 2022, Sweden approved a plan to build its own disposal facility based on the same concept as Onkalo. Other countries, including the UK, the US, France and Canada, are looking at a similar solution to dispose of their nuclear waste. Erika Benke in Western Finland. Flying is one of the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, so cutting back on air travel is one of the best ways to slow global warming. That's not easy if your job depends on travelling, but it's not impossible, as journalist Sam Wilkin discovered. He lives in Belgium and covers the whole of Europe for his role with Politico magazine, yet he still managed to avoid air travel completely for four years. Julian Warwicker spoke to writer Andrew Small and to Sam about the challenge. From about 2017, I tried to fly just once a year. Um, and then when COVID struck in 2020, I ended up not flying for the whole year and traveling a bit more locally by train. Then I got a dog the next year. And so I traveled with her by train. And, and then I was at two years and I thought, let's just see how long I can keep going with this, really. But um, my travel was limited to sort of Paris and, uh, and London for work. And then, you know, for holidays, I... I stuck around Europe. I went down to the south of France several times. I got down to Italy on the trains. I, I got over to Slovenia um, last summer with a, a night train to Vienna and then and then down from there. So e Even if it takes a lot longer? It does sometimes take a lot longer, but it, I think you think of it in, in a different way. And, you know, the night train down to Vienna is not 12 hours of sort of wasted time. That's 12 hours of mostly sleeping. Um, and, <laughs> and often if you're going from city centre to city centre, you know, a flight takes a lot longer than the advertised time. A one-hour flight is actually a four-hour journey where you're up and down and getting undressed and, and it's not a very pleasant time. Whereas, you know, you might have a, a five-hour train ride to, to achieve the same thing and it's a much more, you know, you're sat in one seat, you're having a coffee or a beer, you're reading your book. It, it's a nicer way to pass mm. the time and I think people don't always make that 
comparison. They look at the sticker price or the sticker time on the flight and uh, sort of don't don't think about the other um, time and costs involved. Um, Andrew Small, workable for you, do you think? Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I'm stuck between Asia, Europe, the US, and at times the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, yeah. too. That, pretty that's, regularly. that's tricky for train journeys, isn't it? it? It is tricky for train journeys. I mean, train journeys are, of course, vastly uh, more pleasurable and, and to be preferred whenever possible. Um, and uh, certainly in, in Europe, um, I, I take them um, whenever I humanly can. Um, but unfortunately, there certainly are certain kinds of work that uh, do require these longer hops. And uh, as yet, there's no... Uh, obvious way around that. I mean, I think it's important to not excessively uh, moralise the personal elements of um, uh, how certain people. I mean, we've 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 seen this with critics of people doing a lot of very important work on climate who also mm. have to get around the world um, quite a bit at, at the moment as well. But but certainly, whenever possible, um, I, ideally, it's um, that th- this is uh, flying is 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 no way to travel no. when you can shoot around on these enjoyable train journeys. Andrew Small and Sam Wilkins speaking to Julian Warricker. For many, he's the best football player of his generation, having won many top-tier trophies, including the World Cup, and amassing a fortune estimated at around $600 million. Now the Argentinian player Lionel Messi is leaving his French club, Paris Saint-Germain, and moving to the US, where the 36-year-old will join Inter Miami until 2025 on a deal worth $60 million a season. The sports journalist Tim Vickery says the move will raise the profile of the entire American Major League Soccer. It is a decision, I think, to go to the United States, which is probably based as much on non-football reasons as football reasons. Uh, I think it's because there are a number of options, one of which was back to Argentina. Uh, Another, of course, was Saudi Arabia, which is spending a lot of money, uh, or perhaps finding another club in Europe. And I think he's probably decided that this was the best option for his family especially for his kids but i think what this does is this brings huge credibility to the mls messi doesn't come in here as the savior of a league he comes in now to a league which has been consolidated some 27 years the standard is rising i think the standard will surprise a lot of people scouts very well major league soccer it's not an elephant's graveyard anymore it brings in good young players from South America, it's starting to produce its own players. So I think what what this move will do, two things. Firstly, I think it will shine considerable light and bring attention to Major League Soccer as a whole. Secondly, I think it could change the, uh, the, the infrastructure of, of, of world football, if you like, because South America, Brazil is dominant in South American club football. It doesn't really have too many rivals. Brazilian clubs are now open to be bought by international capital. And if you're one of the money men or women in charge of a Brazilian club, what do you want to do now? You want your side to be playing competitive games against Lionel Messi and clubs from Major League Soccer. So I think we could be looking towards, uh, in the the not too distant future, kind of Pan-American competitions where South American club football with all of its tradition and all of its passion gets together with football in the United States with all of its momentum. Now, just the potential there is of a rival pole to the dominance of European club football. So uh, I I think rather than anything that's going to happen to Messi himself, the more interesting thing for me about this deal is what it's going to mean for Major League Soccer as a whole. Tim Vickery on Lionel Messi's move to the United States. That's all from us for now. There'll be a new edition of the Global News podcast later. If you'd like to comment on this one or on any of the topics that we've covered, do send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on Twitter at Global News Pod. This edition was mixed by Caroline Driscoll. The producer was David Lewis. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Kasia Madeira. Until next time, bye-bye.